Um, I made two little changes to the title. Um, the, the, the prompt you gave me was how to achieve goals. And I added big and a question mark because it's a question, I'm not an expert. Um, this is something that will change your whole life. Your answer to that question, how do you achieve big goals, is gonna change how you act. And, um, and it's not the sort of question that has a definitive answer. It's the sort of question you think about, you think about, and you're 60, you're still thinking about it. Um, so I will present to you, not as like, this is the answer, but as like, Here, here's how I'm thinking about it. And uh, hopefully this will start conversations. Um, so, um, if you're on your mobile phones, I'm assuming it's because you're using these at tags, hashtags. Um, next, great. So what is a goal? A goal is like a thing we want to do. It's really as simple as that. I actually, in pitching Everest all the time, and Everest is an app for achieving personal goals and living your dreams and doing the things you want to do in life, which could be anything. Like we have users on Everest who will have a dream to um, organize their house and they'll take a step to clean the closet or wash the dishes. So literally goals on the really small end are just like things you want to do. Um, and, uh, and then on the, you know, on the big end, they're big things you want to do. So, um, to think of it as like intent or like a motivation is like an important way, I think, definitionally to start this talk. So, um, what is a goal? A goal is something you want to do. Um, every goal has the same basic structure. There's what you want to do, why you want to do it, when you want to do it by, um, and the steps you're going to take to get there, and then your journey is you actually do it. Uh, and so this is actually one of the main assumptions of our whole product and company is that um, goals, if it, you have a goal to become a better tennis player and you have a goal to uh, look like Daniel Craig in a bathing suit and you have a goal to visit Taiwan, like they're all actually, they have very similar attributes. Um, so why don't people achieve more of the things they want to do in life? Um, well, we think that there's like two basic problems. Um, and if you think about your own life, I think you'll probably find these things. So uh, everyone achieves some goals. They get, like, we, one of the goals was we wanted to get here tonight, right? And you guys got here tonight. So it's not that people, nobody achieves, like, everyone achieves some goals. But most people are frustrated because they aren't achieving all the things they want to do in life or as many as they know that they're capable of. And so why don't people achieve things? And we think there's two reasons, lack of organization and lack of support. Um, most people don't, on the organization side, they don't write down the things they want to do. They don't have a process to figure out what steps it takes, and they don't plan and track their steps to fit them into their busy lifestyle. So they need a tool. Um, oops. Uh, and the second reason is lack of support. Uh, most people don't share the things they want to do with their friends, so they don't get encouragement, suggestions, accountability. Um, they can't learn or be inspired by people who've done similar things before. Um, they can't find companions who might want to do it with them because they don't share the things they want to do, and so they need a community. So the idea for Everest was, how do we achieve goals? Well, we use tools plus a community. And so th those are the two sort of design parameters of our application. Um, okay, so then why is it so freaking hard to do the things I want to do in life, right? If it's so inertia, was it, is that? Let's, let's just take like, answers. Why, why is it so hard to achieve goals? If it's tools plus community. Ingrained habits and inertia. Any other answers? Lack of capital. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Lack of discipline. Anyone else? Shout them out. Girls? Beer? That, that is a good reason. Yeah, I like that. Okay, anyone else? Greed? Resourcefulness? Laziness? These are all good reasons. Okay. All right, everything else I'm going to say is like my best attempt to answer this. Um, all right, let's compare two goals or dreams as we put them on Everest. Um, so I have a dream to learn the names of trees and plants on Everest. This is actually one of my dreams. Um, I, I realized one day I could identify almost any brand and yet I had no idea what the green stuff was. So I was like, you know what, I'd really like to know what this stuff is. And this is a small, simple, has been done before kind of goal or thing I want to do. Um, all right, let me give you another one. This is Elon Musk's dream. He wants to terraform Mars. And he's, holy shit, for reals, I'm actually gonna do this about this goal. And this is a big, complex, and has never been done before kind of thing you wanna do. Um, so there's obviously a difference between 
small goals and big goals. And for big goals, organization or, and the tools you need to get organized and support, or the community you need to get support, are necessary but not sufficient conditions for achieving big goals. Um, so here's an important point. Um, I know it's, it's a, about the second anniversary of Steve Jobs' death, is that right? We are honoring Steve Jobs. We're honoring. <laughs> I, I cry when I listen to his narration of uh, the, um, here's the crazy ones. Uh, <laughs> like six in the morning. Like it, it always triggers emotion for me. Um, and, and so as I was creating these slides, I was thinking a lot about him. And one of the things he was, was a contrarian. And I think big goals, things that have never been done before, uh, are inherently contrarian. Um, if it's never been done before, it's probably because people have never tried it, or they've tried and they've failed, and they're like, it's impossible. But you say, no, it's, it's actually just difficult, but it is possible. Um, and uh, startups, for example, are essentially a vehicle for going after big goals, uh, crazy things that have never been done before. Um, that's why starting a company is contrarian. So let me give you a framework. Um, so, have you guys heard of efficient market theory? Yeah. Okay, so efficient market theory, <laughs> A student, A. Um, efficient market theory is the whole idea that uh, uh, the price of Apple, let's say it's $400, is the price of Apple because that's actually how much it's worth. Um, that everything that should be funded is being funded, that everything that should be being done is being done, that the market is totally rational. Um, but actually, it's wrong. Um, and all opportunity is created by inefficient markets. So when you're starting a company, you're essentially going on the rooftops and shouting at the top of your lungs and you're saying, hey market, hey world, you're wrong. Because if you were right, this company would already exist, but it doesn't exist, so I'm starting it. Um, and so when you're going after a big goal, you're essentially saying, everyone, you're wrong. Um, and I think this is possible. Um, and I'm gonna go after it. Uh, because big goals are big, they require help. You can't just do it on your own. So the ironic thing is that even though they're contrarian, other people, like, you're making a contrarian statement so other people don't want to help you. So in order to get the help that you need to do the big goal, you have to um, turn other people into contrarians, which is ironic, right? Does, that, does everyone understand why that's ironic? Okay. Um, anyone? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so um, there's the way things are, which you might call reality, and then there's the way things could be, which you might call a possible reality. Uh, and there are many possible realities. Uh, and then there's the possible reality that you're most invested in. The one that you think is very possible and also extremely desirable or beautiful. And if you can convince, and that's what you might call your vision. Um, and if you can convince people that there is a way things could be that is possible and desirable and beautiful and that we should work to make it so, and that here's the strategy for getting from here to there, that is how you turn them into a contrarian because other people don't necessarily believe in that possible reality, but if you can get more people to believe in that possible reality, then maybe it becomes reality someday. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, people who achieve big goals must have a strong vision that they believe in with all of their heart and mind. So think about Steve Jobs. Who saw the Jobs movie? And who read the, who, all right, who saw the movie? Okay. Kutcher was great. Um, who read the book, the, uh, the actual biography? Okay. Um, so, uh, who here totally is a hero worshiper? Okay, All right, I am. Um, so this is definitely, like, whether you love him or you hate him, he believed that this is the way things should be, right? Um, there, uh, there should only be one button on the iPhone, right? Uh, he, he, he had this sense of conviction um, that was uh, a, a unique character trait. Most people, when everyone says, like, you know, no, it just can't be done, like, it's not even, en the engineering isn't even possible. And he's like, no, the engineering is possible. Try harder, right? That's sort of, that sort of um, chutzpah, thank you, uh, is, is, is what comes when you really believe that something is possible. So why did he believe these things were possible? Why did he have so much conviction? In order to have conviction, you have to have reasons why. So behind any entrepreneur's vision, there's a ton of logic. Um, and if you sat with an entrepreneur and you said, hey, look, why do you believe that this company is a good idea? You're a contrarian. Everyone doesn't think this is a good idea. You think it's a good idea. Why? Give me your reasons. 
they could probably take 10 days out of your life explaining to you all the reasons why, right? Um, and so when you're doing like a pitch with an investor, you're trying to condense it into like half an hour or an hour. Um, so you have to have an argument that reconciles not only with how you understand reality, but also which stands up to the criticism of others. Does this make sense? Okay. I like audience participation, so say yes or no and, and, and say why. Um, so given that, and I, I'm condensing like five slides into one slide here, but I'm going to introduce a number of frameworks. So um, I've always believed in my vision for Everest, um, and then I've started to realize how complex reality is. And um, whenever you start a company, uh, it's hard. Like, you, you probably, we have this optimism bias. We think it's going to be easier than it is. Uh, and it's, I think Coco Chanel has this famous quote, like, I, I'm probably going to totally get this wrong, but it's something like, uh, uh, the advantage that people who haven't done it before have is that they haven't done it before, right? Uh, and so they actually go for it. Um, so I'm going to introduce like four, three philosophers and a scientist. So according to Immanuel Kant, Kant broke reality up into two parts. There was reality itself, which is infinite and multi-layered and complex. So let me give you an example. If you think you understand yourself, who here thinks they understand their self, themselves? Okay, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. You are so much more complicated than you think you are. Um, and who thinks they understand like this room? Like we don't understand this room. Like who understands fluorescent lighting or, or how that chair is constructed? Or like, there's complexity all around us on so many different levels. Um, the problem is like if we embrace all that complexity, uh, we are kind of overwhelmed by it, we can't function. So we need to create maps or models or frameworks. We use language and code to describe reality, the reality in which we live in, and to create simplifications that we can operate with, right? Um, so, uh, so the problem is that whenever you make a, a model, it can break because it is a simplification. You don't think there's a wall there, so you walk into it and then boom, it's a wall. And you're like, damn it, my model was wrong. So let me give you an example. Um, you're fundraising. You think the market works like this. You think investors will react to what you do like this. And then you do it, and then they don't. And you're like, damn it, my model was wrong. What did I learn? I learned this. So next time, I'm going to do that, right? We go through this process every day. Um, and this is like, you go through a breakup, right? Uh, you go through a breakup, and it's like, why didn't I see that coming? Um, and, and then it's like, oh, my model was this about our relationship. My model was this about her. This is how I understood it, and I was so wrong. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's Kant. All right, Hegel. Um, for every argument, there's a counterargument. So Hegel thought history progressed by thesis, counterthesis, synthesis. The synthesis becomes a new thesis, and there's a counterthesis and a synthesis. And it just keeps going on. And he called this process dialectic. Um, no matter what I say, and matter of fact, my whole entire talk, you could present a counter-argument. As a matter of fact, you guys probably will. You guys are going to be drinking later, and you'll be like, ah, that's Speaker Francis. He's full of shit. He said this, and like, I think this, right? Okay, the thing is that you're probably right, and I, I'm probably right, and I have an argument, and you have an argument, and we just disagree. And there's probably a way to disagree with both of us. Um, so how do you have conviction when no matter what position you take, you know as a rational person there's a reason why not to agree with yourself, right? Does that make sense? Um, the third thing, Taleb, uh, there is what we know, there, there's three categories of knowledge. There's what we know, there's what we know we don't know, the knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. The things we don't know, we don't know. Now most people agree with this, like, right? Is it, is it obvious? So that, actually, the, when this entered the popular mind, it was when Donald Rumsfeld uh, talked about the Iraq War. He used this, he got a lot of criticism, but he's actually, this is totally correct. Um, and most people think the first category is the largest and the last category is the smallest. Most people think that in terms of all the knowledge that's out there, I know a lot of it. I don't know some of it, but I kind of know what I don't know. I don't really know anything about physics, but whatever. And then, like, there's some things I don't even know I don't know about, kind of what happened, maybe, well, actually, what happens at the CIA is a known unknown. I don't know what happens at the CIA, but, like, there's probably some stuff I haven't even considered that are blind spots, but there's probably not too much of it, right? Actually, I was at the gym um, on Sunday, 
and there's this old guy, this guy's 70, and he was working out like so intense. He was working out way harder than I think I've ever worked out. And I started a conversation with him. Turns out he's the chairman of Pixar, uh, Ed Catmull. And uh, I was like, okay, I understand why you're successful. <laughs> uh, you work hard. Um, tell me uh, some of what you've learned. And he said, I, you know, I've just actually finished a book. It's going to be published. Um, I started asking him questions. And he actually came to that, that point. And they said, the, the, the thing is that the last category is the largest, that the things that you don't know you don't know are actually massive. Okay. So if you think you understand, like if you think you have conviction, it's because of your known knowns, but like how can you have conviction if you don't know most things? <laughs> According to Kelvin, Kelvin, uh, Lord Kelvin, second law of thermodynamics, everything's falling apart. Um, okay, so why would you build a company if everything is falling apart? And if it's hard to, to create order in the universe, right? Okay, so these are four chaos theories essentially, right? That entrepreneurs are like flying in the face of. Why are we doing it? Um, how in the midst of so much uncertainty can we find certainty to do the things and build the companies that we believe need to be built to go after the big goals? So I found that through all my confusion and doubt as I've realized this and I've been like, holy shit, I don't know anything. Um, you can emerge with faith and hope because in the end, you choose your path. Um, you can comprehend as much as you can, and you can always try to know everything and like gain more certainty. But at the end of the day, you have to ask, your, ask yourself the question, all right, how shall we then live? Like, how do I go about my day to day? What am I gonna do? Who am I? And the choices we make are all the more significant for their uncertainty. Um, they're more brave. Uh, they say more about us, and they say more about what we value, their statements. Does this make sense? Most of the time we think we make decisions when we're certain that they're right. But when you actually think about it, most of the time you're making decisions that you have no certainty about, and yet you're making them, and that's significant. Okay? So, here's the framework. This is actually the framework for probably every single decision you make in life. Value must be greater than cost plus opportunity cost. Simple, right? Then why are decisions so complicated? They're so complicated. It's that simple. They're so complicated because those variables break down into complexity. Um, one of the things that makes it complicated is that we live in a world of infinite opportunity cost, and a lot of the opportunity cost is unknown. So for example, let's take marriage for example. You could marry her, and you know the women that you know, but there's all the women you don't know. You know what, let's just date, right? Okay, um, yeah, so, okay, same thing with a business, right? Let, let's say, let's, to miss your turns, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so it's the same thing with a business. You could start this business, but there's any number of businesses you could be starting. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Um, and uh, so why are you doing this business? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into this a little bit and think about, about this. I think I've recently realized, uh, and this is sort of one of these things that you do like over time, I think, in life. You, you realize obvious things that have been staring you in the face. Um, I think there's three questions that life asks of us all the time every day. Um, what do you value? How do you express the fact that you value it? And then what are you willing to pay for it? So let's dive into that. What are you valuable? Uh, there's other words for value, so synonyms. What is beautiful? What is good? What is worthy? What is desirable? Um, remember, goals are just what we want, so we generally want what's valuable. Um, so what do you want? Once you decide something is beautiful, let's say you see a beautiful sunset, right, and you're walking along the beach. Um, Beauty demands a response. Um, how are you going to express the fact that you value it? Maybe you're going to express the fact that you value the sunset by walking on the beach and enjoying the sunset. Maybe it strikes you so meaningfully that just walking on the beach is not enough. I need to write a poem, or I need to paint a painting, uh, or I need to take my friend here, or I need to come more often. Um, 
So an example of this would be like, I think that uh, recruiting is broken and it's so broken and I think that like it's so valuable to have good recruiting that the way I'm gonna express my response, I'm gonna start a, uh, a recruiting startup, right? Um, or like, uh, I think you're, I love you so much, I value you so much, I'm gonna propose to you, right? Um, so if you value it, then the last question is, how much are you willing to pay for it? Um, and this is quantified in time, energy, effort, money, um, opportunity cost, sacrifice. And uh, I almost feel like as soon as you decide that something is valuable to you, as soon as you decide that you want something, you really want it, the universe like shakes you and says, how much are you willing to pay for it, right? Um, and it's like, this much? Yeah, I'll pay that much. That much? Okay, fine. That much, yes. And like, and, and, and I think that like, when you realize the shakedown of cost, uh, you, you very quickly realize the things that you're willing to pay anything for, you, for and the things that you're, like, you're willing to pay some amount for. Um, there's a big difference. Um, and I think that like, it's one of these things where pain and pleasure are very yin and yang, right? Like you want this pleasure, you want something, but then like how much pain are you willing to go through to get it? Um, so, uh, if I've totally descended into philosophy, I might as well just go all the way and say something cheesy, like love conquers all, right? Um, so, this may be true, um, if you consider that very few things are worth paying any price. Um, and those things that are worth paying any price, those are the things that you truly, deeply love. And if you feel this way about something, there's no surrender. You're like Winston Churchill in World War II. You're like, we will never, ever, ever, ever give in because we will rather die than lose to this guy or, or make peace with Hitler, right? And, and when you feel that way, then it's more likely that you succeed in the long run um, and if victory is possible. So uh, take a startup, for example. Because starting a company to work on a big goal is contrarian, um, there's a lot of rejection. A lot, like, I, actually, this is one of the reasons why Steve Jobs hated customer feedback. Hated customer research. I know what people want. They don't want a faster horse, they want the Model T, right? This is like one of his defining traits. Lean startup theory is so freaking wrong because it's all about relying on customers and users for, for, to, to know what they want. They just don't know what they want. Um, because like what they want is contrarian. Um, and so, uh, so to that point, like if, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you have a contrarian statement, you're gonna get a lot of rejection. And when you get a lot of rejection, bad things happen, right? So here's an example of what, what might happen if you get a lot of rejection from investors. You don't raise any money. From customers, you don't close any customers on your new crazy model. Uh, from talent, nobody wants to work at your company, right? And then there's that scene in the movie where he's like called 100 investors and he shouts, what is wrong with people? Right? And then, right then, success is just around the corner, literally, and the, the dude pulls up in his, his car and walks into the living room and gives them a check. And that's how Apple started, right? So, um, over time, Apple started, it was super contrarian and only one person believed, and eventually we all believed, right? Uh, that was a 30 year process. So, um, when you're willing to make the hundredth phone call, when you're willing to make the thousandth phone call, when you're willing to do anything it takes, you take on a new power because you put yourself beyond the, ability of, uh, beyond the possibility of defeat. The only way you could have stopped that man was by killing him. That's powerful. Um, so we return to the question and then I'll shut up. Um, how to achieve big goals. Um, so organization and support are necessary, but not sufficient conditions for achieving big goals. It requires a lot of conviction and sacrifice. And people only gain this conviction when they confront a complex, uncertain reality and still emerge defiant. And people only sacrifice when they believe it's worth it. It's a choice and a statement of value. <laughs> I'm gonna quote a speech that came into my life through a freaking email that went to this guy's homepage and went to a YouTube video and it just hit me in the middle of this week and stuck with me. And um, you sort of choke up privately in the office and nobody really realizes you're going through an emotional moment. 
Um, John F. Kennedy's speech at Rice University when he announced the, the fact that the United States was going to go on, on a moon program. And I'm going to do my little JFK impression because no, I'm not. Uh, but I will read the words. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win and the others too. Doesn't that make you proud to be an American? Choose to go to the moon. All right.